Hello, hello students. Welcome to part two of this chapter, Concepts of Care for Patients with Malnutrition. And right now, we are going to cover the undernutrition part. So undernutrition is a multi-nutrient problem, multi-nutrient problem. Um, because if a patient does not or cannot consume calories and proteins, intake of healthy nutrients is compromised. So again, if a patient does not or cannot consume calories and protein, intake of healthy nutrients is compromised. So sometimes this situation results in an adult admitted to the hospital or long-term care facility. For example, decreased staffing may not allow time for patients who need to be fed, especially older adults who may eat slowly. Here, I'm going to make a parenthesis to invite you for a reflection. Honestly, nursing, I understand many people study nursing because of the good salaries, but you need to have enough compassion you need to do your job and to care for the patients in order to sleep well at the end of the night. So it's not possible that somebody goes to the shift, they, they, their work shift, and you don't have time to feed the patient because you have to leave early. Okay, you take that position, you are going to fulfill the responsibilities of a good nurse. It's your responsibility to clean the patient. It's respons your responsibility to feed the patient, to provide proper care for the patient. If not, trust me, sooner or later, you're going to lose your license and you're not going to be hired for better positions even if you have your license as a nurse, okay? So it takes compassion to take care of these patients. Let's continue. Many diagnostic tests, surgery, trauma, and unexpected medical complications require a period of MPO, nothing per oral, in which nutrients are not being consumed or cause anorexia, which is a loss of appetite. Okay, um, common complications of undernutrition, let's break down this into systems. Cardiovascular is a reduced cardiac output. Now, endocrine is going to cause cold intolerance, gastrointestinal, we see anorexia, diarrhea, malabsorption, vomiting, uh, weight loss. Um, immunologic susceptibilities to infectious disease because the nutrients are having certain amount of vitamins and minerals that are going to strengthen your immune system. Okay, so the proteins are going to help in the regulation of how the fluids are going to be um, positioned in your system. If there is no enough protein, albumin is going to be low, therefore edema is going to be uh, present, okay, and that is going to cause the cardiovascular. You know, you have to think about that. Uh, musculoskeletal, cachicia, decreased muscle mass, impaired functional ability, neurologic is going to be the weakness, especially if the patient is not consuming good animal protein, which is going to help you with the B12 absorption, right? And any deficiency in B12 is going to cause neurological problems. Respiratory reduced vital capacity. Okay, meals in the healthcare setting. In some cases, undernutrition results when meals provided in the healthcare setting differ from what the patient usually eats. Be sure to identify the specific food preferences uh, that the patient can eat and enjoy. There are keeping with personal cultural practices. Etiology, uh, protein, energy, undernutrition, PEU, formerly protein, color, and malnutrition, has two common forms. So we have one is marasmus, and B is washer core. Okay, 
So, what is the nutrition Stanford Center for? Okay. Let me share this video with you. So, we are going to understand much better what I just mentioned. What is malnutrition? Imagine if our communities are filled with children who are strong, healthy, and well-nourished. Their bodies get enough energy and nutrients to grow and develop well. Sadly, this is not a reality for many children. As you care for the children in your community, you may see that some are not getting enough nutritious food for their bodies to grow properly. This threat is called malnutrition, and if it continues for a long time, it can cause lifelong damage, such as impaired growth and developmental delays. Mm -hmm. Malnourished children are more likely to die than well-nourished children. There are different types of malnutrition, but this module will focus on undernutrition. This is when a child does not get enough nutrients to grow and develop properly. The child can be affected in several ways. First, undernutrition for a short time can cause wasting, which is a low weight for height. They will appear thin. If a child does not get enough nutrients for a long time, this affects their growth and they may be stunted, which means have low height for age they will look short for their age. Long-term undernutrition can also cause a child to be underweight, which is low weight for age. An underweight child may be wasted, stunted, or both. Severe and continuous malnutrition can lead to kwashiorkor or marasmus. Kwashiorkor is caused by a severe lack of protein. This is often because the child is not eating enough protein, but can be made worse by absorption difficulties if the child has measles or diarrheal illnesses. This lack of protein causes fluid to gather in the body, leading to swelling called nutritional oedema. Common signs of kwashiorkor are a round face and a distended or round stomach. Also, Look out for swollen feet and legs. Another video will show you how to identify if the child may have kwashiorkor by checking for swelling of both feet. Marasmus occurs when the child has not taken in enough calories and does not have the energy to keep their body working properly. To identify marasmus, look out for a child who is thin weak and tired. They may also be short for their age due to malnutrition during their critical growth periods. A video in this module will show you how to determine if the child may have marasmus by a red reading on the mid-upper arm circumference or MOAC tape. By recognizing these signs of malnutrition, you can take steps to get children the support they need to recover from malnutrition. It's very important to uh, understand these concepts from the optic of the children and also the elderly, right? So marasmus is a calorie nutrition in which body fat and protein are wasted. Serum proteins are often preserved. And quashi war Quashiorcor is a lack of protein quantity and quality in the presence of adequate calories. Body weight is more normal and serum proteins are low. So it's based on one is calories and the other one is proteins. Okay, uh, starvation, a complete lack of nutrients, is an acute and severe form of protein energy undernutrition, which usually occurs when food is unavailable. This is this, um, these concepts are very sad and immediately my mind is traveling to certain points in some other continents when we know how is the condition of the children, right? I am already traveling right now to two different countries. 
um, signs and symptoms of nutrient deficiencies. Uh, if we are going to assess the eye, the hair, you're going to see alopecia. That means that the uh, deficiency is in zinc, okay? But before analyzing this, uh, because this is a very important part of this lecture. I am going to invite you to review this website from the Harvard uh, TH Chan School of Public Health. They have developed this website and this um, presentation with a table, very interesting table with recommended daily intake of vitamins and minerals for adults. So you can, um, if you follow the link, you can go through all the vitamins and minerals right and the recommended uh, daily intake for women for men and the upper limits okay so i gave you this is a very um uh, it's a good source of information with all vitamins and minerals that you must um follow now when i am talking about this the first step is you need to go to the pcp or your gastroenterologist and request okay because you you shouldn't be prescribing yourself with vitamins and minerals until you have the complete evaluation the complete um, examination blood work of what's going on you don't want to um, have an overdose okay certain vitamins and minerals um, like vitamin d b12 um, any of the B vitamins, if you are under the normal range or above the normal range, you can have neurologic problems. And vitamin D must be within normal limits, neither above, neither below. Okay, so that's why it's very important to go to the doctor, check all your vitamins and minerals. If your provider is not able to, to, to order that, a gastroenterologist would be um, more likely to order those uh, tests for you, okay, including folic acid, vitamin C, all the list of uh, uh, vitamins and minerals that I am showing uh, in the website from Harvard. Once you have that, then you start working on your, um, on your, um, on taking the vitamins that you need. So, Professor Matalana, why it's not good enough just to take um, a multivitamin, one tablet multivitamin, right? Um, supplement, multivitamin and multimineral supplement, because not everybody has the same needs. These uh, supplements have, have been created um, based on standards uh, requirements. So it's better if you obtain your blood work and everything is normal, then you can take your multivitamin and mineral, which is going to just support your good health. But if you don't have these uh, regular levels, normal levels, then you need to take some vitamins, higher doses than, than others, right? So it, it's very important. Okay, if you see a patient with alopecia, think about think. Um, Cork screw uh, hair, which is also called scurvy, is a lack of vitamin C, okay? Decreased pigmentation is a lack of uh, protein. Um, in terms of alopecia, when you can easily remove your hair, means that you need protein. Um, in terms of eyes, dryness of conjunctiva is vitamin A right corneal vascularization means that you need riboflavin which is your vitamin b2 please count how many times i'm going to mention b vitamins in this table okay so you can understand how important is your b complex um keratomalacia is an eye condition in which the cornea the clear front of part of the eye gets cloudy and softness okay that's keratomalacia this eye disease often start as serophophthalma which is severe dryness of the cornea and conjunctiva so for this keratomalacia or the other um, um, disease mentioned before is vitamin a deficiency Betot spots, keratin buildup in the conjunctiva is um, 
vitamin A as well. So uh, let me see if, if I can get a picture of these B dot spots so you can uh, have an idea. Wow, the link is very long. Okay, but anyway, we need to see it. It's the most important, right? How can I teach you if you don't see it? So, mm -hmm. uh, I think I didn't copy the link appropriately. So it's going to be B dot spots. Let me see if I can do it. B dot spots. Okay. Um, okay, there you go. You can see this one here. So those spots are B dot spots. Okay. Um, so that's cause because of, okay, let me close this one. That is caused because of the vitamin A. GI tract, nausea, vomiting, probably is pyridoxin, which is another type of vitamin B, is the vitamin B6. And then we have diarrhea, think about zinc and niacin, which is vitamin B3. Mm -hmm. Then stomatitis is pyridoxin, which is B6, your riboflavin, vitamin B2, iron, chelosis is B6. And you see how many glossitis, which is your B6, zinc, B3, folic acid, which is your B9, okay, if you didn't know. Folic acid is your B9 and B12. So magenta tongue, also vitamin A and riboflavin. So um, swollen, bleeding gums, vitamin C, fissure tongue, niacin, uh, vitamin B3. Hepatomegaly is um, protein deficiency. If you analyze the skin, dry and a scaling is gonna be vitamin A, petechiae, vitamin C, follicular hyperkeratosis, follicular hyperkeratosis is vitamin A, and that's good to know. I am going to test you on follicular hyperkeratosis. Um, you see, nasolabial seborrhea, ni niacin, which is B3, bilateral dermatitis, B3, musculoskeletal, subcutaneous, fat loss, calories, um, everything related to musculoskeletal basically is calories, protein, and vitamin D, osteomyelitia, we know is vitamin D, rickets also, um, hematologic, your anemias, vitamin B12, iron folic acid, which is B9, Cooper, vitamin E, leukopenia, neutropenia, Cooper. Okay, that's why it's very important to do your blood test. It's very important. Can you imagine going to any um, supplement store? Oh, I, I need Cooper. You need, um, you need to measure this, okay, because you don't want to have leukopenia or neutropenia, okay? Low protombin time, prolonged clotting time, vitamin K, manganese. Vitamin K is another vitamin, um, which is a fat soluble. Remember this um, mnemonic, ADEC, A-D-E-K. Those four are fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K. Um, this uh, belongs to your addict. Um, let me write it down here. So it's going to be much better for you to remember. Neurologic disorientation, um, confabulation. All these are B vitamins, right? B1. Uh, okay, let me see. Vitamin K is addict. Addict your fat soluble. Fat soluble vitamins okay um okay you have in neurologic your chromium you, basically i've seen many stores selling this chromium picolinate and people they are buying it but there's a risk uh, especially diabetes that they they are taking chromium there is a risk for neuropathy okay um and uh, paresthesia, vitamin uh, B1, pyridoxin, vitamin B12, uh, cardiovascular, all these vitamins, selenium is another one. 
if you have excess selenium, you can start the vomiting process very soon. Okay, so that's why I strongly suggest you, that's why I got this uh, website from Harvard. So you can check first before starting any multivitamin with your PCP and you can even go over the list. Sometimes uh, the primary care providers and the gastroenterologists, this is very important, huh? they have some uh, softwares, okay, um, um, like eClinical or maybe some other onco, onco clinical, onco this EMR, right? That are um, softwares where they basically do their documentation. And these softwares are prepared with a list of supplements, uh, vitamins and minerals for, for blood tests, right? And the doctors, they don't even have to type what vitamin they are going to check. So they just click um, blood work for vitamins and minerals and the list sometimes is not complete. So you must copy all the vitamins and minerals you want to be checked for and then compare it with whatever he's ordering. Make sure the full list is there. You don't want to wait one week, 10 days, two weeks, and then figure out that he forgot to order, for example, um, vitamin C or vitamin E. Vitamin E also is crucial, okay? Um, which is usually not... Um, uh, tested vitamin E. Okay, assessing the older adult for undernutrition. Um, the physical concerns is about constipation, decreased appetite, failure to thrive. A combination of three or five symptoms, including weakness, older adult is weak, a slow walking speed, low physical activity, unintentional weight loss, and exhaustion. And here in my neighbor, I have a lady that basically she really match this full um, five symptoms it's very sad she lives by herself um, her family is living in Florida and um, California so she's by herself and she um, uses a walker uh, and she's trying to walk around the neighbor but you can see that she's losing weight uh, very fast and sometimes it's difficult to talk to her because she is not open for a conversation so this condition is affecting her mental state as well so it's very sad to see these patients when they get lonely and depressed um, they may have also impaired eyesight Pain is acute or persistent, weight loss, we spoke about this. So what medications can affect the taste and the smell, right? Um, let's see this list of medications that can affair, affect the taste and the smell. Um, we have, for example, antibiotics, amoxicillin, acetromycin, ciprofloxacin. Think about these patients that are having um, problems with their throat, uh, they are having common flu, or they are having otitis media, and they are taking amoxicillin, um, blood pressure medications, amlodipine, uh, enalapril, statins, Atorvastatin, patients that are suffering from cholesterol, thyroid medications, levothyroxine, okay, so um, drugs that affect the taste like aspirin, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, your Tylenol, okay, so um, you have to be aware of all of this. Remember that your NCLEX is almost 35% medications. You must be aware of this. And that's the way, that is why I am giving you this website so you can double check on everything. Um, psychosocial concerns, inability to prepare meals due to functional decline, fatigue, knowledge, deficit and memory, decreasing enjoyment of meal. We, they, they live alone. They don't enjoy the meals, right? 
right? They are sometimes waiting for Christmas to have most of the family visit them, okay? So Christmas is the big uh, time of the year and sometimes they don't have visitors because visitors um, made other plans. So social depression, inconability to afford food, loneliness, proximity to sources of nutrient dense food, uh, transportation access to get the sources of nutrients dense food. So all of these affects and as I told you before, count how many times I'm going to make a relation between um, the mental state, right? The psychological state and the nutritional, the GI um, condition. So the nutrition is first, right? And based on the nutrition, we are going to have a healthy gastrointestinal. Acute uh, PEU uh, may develop in patients who were adequately nourished before hospitalization but experienced starvation while in a catabolic state from infection, stress, or injury. Chronic PEU can occur in those who have a chronic health condition such as cancer, end stage kidney or liver disease or chronic neurologic disease. So also we have patients that are having psychiatric disorders. Have you counted how many times in the previous video and this video I am making a correlation between mental and psychological states and nutritional and GI? Um, psych Psychiatric diagnosis with causative agents of psychiatric origin. For example, anorexia nervosa, which is a self-induced state of starvation resulting from a fear of fatness. Even though the patient is underweight, this condition is often accompanied by a psychiatric diagnosis of body dysmorphic uh, disorder, uh, which is an obsessive compulsive condition in which patients spend an abnormal amount of time attempting to reach what they consider to be the body perfection is psychological. Bulimia nerviosa um, is characterized by episodes of binge eating in which the patient ingests a large amount of food in a short time. So the binge eating is followed by some form of purging behavior such as self-induced vomiting or excessive use of laxative and diuretics. How many celebrities we know that went through these uh, disorders? So if not treated, death can result from starvation, infection or suicide. Again, another psychological um, condition. Binge eating disorder is a separate psychiatric diagnosis from bulimia nerviosa. It's very sad. Here is the scary statistics. It's scary. Globally, there are about 462 million people who are underweight. 462 million people who are underweight. Data are difficult to collect regarding patients who are malnourished as they are seen in a variety of settings for multiple concerns, many of which are perceived to be unrelated to nutrition. However, the total world population is 8.1 billion. 8.1 billion. From that 8.1 billion, I can tell you I've seen the statistics of obesity is one third of the population is overweight of or obese. From the 8.1 billion, which is 8,000 million, one third would be 2,400 million people that are overweight or obese in the whole world. From that 8.1 also, 462 million are underweight. And this statistic, okay, uh, in regards of patients who are malnourished is not complete because there are many countries in Africa, many, that are not in the equation and they are not um, considered in the statistics for different reasons, right? For different reasons. The, um, sometimes the uh, representatives that are, are doing these statistics, they don't have enough people or volunteers to go there and make the contability, the accounting. So we have to think about that. Right now we have another, another um, problem right now in the world, right? We have people that are starving under starvation in this, in this words, 
in these wars that are occurring in in Ukraine and um, and Gaza, right? So um, we have that people also. The numbers maybe are not realistic. Protein, energy, and their nutrition. Older adults are most at risk for poor nutrition, especially protein, energy, uh, and their nutrition. Um, care of, of older adults at risk for undernutrition. Um, assess for psychosocial concerns that can impact their desire or ability to consume nutrient-rich food. Sometimes they have, you know, they have the money. Uh, but they don't have the desire to buy and cook uh, delicious meals, right? If any of these concerns is rooted in mental health, such as depression or loneliness, collaborate with a mental health professional, such as a counselor or psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner who can work with the patient to enhance emotional well-being. This is very nice to be written in the book, but uh, in reality, um, when an older adult does not want to be treated or they don't want to have any contact or they don't feel like communicating, that's the issue. Um, we need more practitioners to visit patients at home and we need uh, more support at home, at home, because sometimes they don't even go to a doctor. Health promotion, disease prevention, it is estimated that 50 to 71% of older adult patients are malnourished before hospital admission. Wow, 50 to 71%. Wow. It is also thought that one third of nourished older people, one third who are admitted will develop some degree of malnutrition during, during hospitalization. One third who are admitted will develop some degree of malnutrition because sometimes healthcare um, practitioners are not considering the factors that we are mentioning in this chapter, like you have to uh, evaluate the patient on their culture, their preference. Uh, but sometimes uh, the hospitals, they don't have enough um, support to cook different types of pills based on the culture, right? Um, so sometimes the food is very general for everybody and the, pa the patients, they don't like the food. They don't like what they are eating. The patient with undernutrition, for patients with undernutrition, consult with a registered dietitian nutritionist who can assist with meeting nutritional needs while the patient is hospitalized as well as help with planning for continued nutritional health after discharge. So here you have a very nice um, article uh, that you can go through and read uh, very carefully. So um, patients with undernutrition takes place in a variety of settings such as the home, the community and the hospital. So in the assessment, we have to consider um, uh, the weight of the patient, right? Keep in mind that an intentional weight loss of 5% in 30 days. These numbers are important. They are very important. They are very helpful for you to assess who is at risk. It works. 5% in 30 days, okay? Or 10% over a six month period significantly affect nutrition status and should be further evaluated. So you are going to ask about usually uh, the usual f daily food intake, uh, food preferences, eating behaviors and patterns, uh, change in appetite, recent weight changes, economic status. That's very important. It, it, it may seem like, uh, yeah, I know we need to ask for those factors, yeah. But at the end, when you are doing the interview, right, you are not asking this. A full, because you, you may feel like the patient is going to tell you by, by herself or himself what's going on in their lives. And it's not true. You need to ask specific questions. A full nutrition history usually includes a 24-hour recall of food intake and the frequency with which foods are consumed. Okay, let me make another parenthesis here. I have many patients 
uh, that are that get get to me they are coming to me and they are asking me for help to lose weight what is the best nutrition for them based on their uh, comorbidities or different conditions right so you can you can uh, predict what is going to be the outcome of that um, approach when you ask that particular patient to tell you specifically i need you to let me know in written okay what did you eat in the last three days that's my personal approach here in the book you have a 24-hour recall for me it's very important the last three days breakfast i got my coffee which is a regular coffee it's not decaf with two teaspoons of white sugar okay that's different that same i got coffee in the morning and then i got one toast so i don't know what type of coffee i don't know what type of sugar you see it has to be detailed okay um i got a toast what type of toast is it white bread is it wheat bread is it a, a bread with seeds okay um then i got maybe um bread with butter what type of butter is it a butter organic which is only milk and salt if you go and read your labels you're going to see you're going to be surprised you buy butter and in the back of the package is going to say milk and salt that's the butter you need to buy is very pure butter right and the other types of butter are going to have like six or seven lines of ingredients that's the type of butter you shouldn't buy okay even though they says the butter is going to say less cholesterol two percent five percent no you need to buy the one that it says milk and salt okay now another problem is how much of that particular butter which is milk and salt you're going to consume that's another issue okay so you need to be descriptive i got wheat toast bread with what one a teaspoon of butter that only contains milk and salt then i got juice okay uh, orange juice okay what type of orange juice is it coming from the bottle is it a fresh squeeze orange juice you see that is the type of description that you need to provide to your nutritionist or your provider when i get that information in in that detail with those details now i know the patient is really serious about their nutrition if, if sometimes i request this information and they they don't give me nothing they give me nothing so i know they are not in the step to do the change they are not they are just asking by curiosity so when you get the type of patients that are asking you for help and they don't provide you with the complete description that means they are not ready for the change okay and uh, if an if a regular adult is not going to provide you this type of description imagine an older adult when you're interviewing and they are going to tell you yeah i got my coffee with bread and butter and you know some uh, strawberry jelly you don't know if they did the, the jelly if they bought from the store okay so you have to be specific be aware that patients who live in food deserts urban area where fresh healthy food is in low supply or unaffordable may have difficulty obtaining food that is densely uh, nutritious and um there are some other adults that they really like very nutritious organic food and they go and look for the amish communities um that they prepare everything homemade right from cheese all the way to peanut butter um and when when uh, they don't have uh, nobody to uh, to take them to those communities basically they don't eat they don't want to eat the processed food from the supermarkets so that's too many uh, factors that you need to take into consideration now the centers for disease control and prevention division of nutrition physical activity and obesity are working to promote good nutrition regular physical activity and healthy weight for everyone 
collect information that identifies the knowledge a patient have about healthy eating and movement and that helps to con to determine which teaching will be most beneficial. So this is extremely important. I was so happy to find finally this website. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Division for Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity are working to promote good nutrition, regular physical activity and healthy weight for everyone. Here is the website. Um, I am giving all this information in the supplemental file. Um, Division of Nutrition, Physical Obesity. Look at this map. Look at this map. Basically, all the states in red or orange either are overweight. I'm sorry. Or they are obese or extremely obese. Okay. This is the 2022. Um, the 2022 uh, adult obesity prevalence maps for 50 states, right? Um, yes, here is very close. So you can see 30% to 35% are the one in orange. All those in red are 35 to 40% 40 obesity. 40 to 45 are the dark red like Oklahoma and uh, Louisiana, I think is this one. Um, more than 50% are the ones with the dots. Um, so uh, how many do we see in green? Only District of Columbia, right? Is uh, New Jersey is 25 to 30, Vermont, and then New York is 30 to 35. This is, this is, this is an issue. People are eating too much junk food, fast food. Okay, let's go back to the lecture. So that's why I told you this chapter is the most important. If you control your nutrition, your GI is going to be good. And all, remember that all the diseases starts in the gastrointestinal, all the way from hypertension, diabetes, pancreatitis, uh, gallbladder conditions, cancer, you name it. Everything, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, even though there is genetic factors, if you provide a good environment to the cells, you are not going to have these problems. So nutrition is the most important. Uh, action alert, uh, assess for difficulty or pain with chewing or swallowing and recognize this phage is a common problem among older adults and can cause undernutrition, dehydration and aspiration pneumonia. Uh, physical assessment, signs and symptoms, inspect the hair and all the different factors we just review in that table, right? From the anthropometric all the way to hair, neurology, musculoskeletal, and a three-day calorie intake may be collected and then calculated by the, there you go, three days. Uh, psychosocial assessment, the psychosocial history provides information about the patient's economic status, occupation, educational level, ethnicity, race. I was the other day, um, um, we need to stop somewhere that sells, that sells fast food because we need to use the restroom. So I was very sad to see these families uh, with uh, toddlers. It was a family. Uh, mother and father with four toddlers four toddlers okay and they were all eating french fries and chicken nuggets or whatever it is and the mother was asking the baby do you like barbecue sauce or hot uh, ketchup um and they were just eating this and they were all overweight even the toddlers which is not nice so we are basically educating a generation of people who is going to become uh, obese in the future with a lot of comorbidities. That's the reality in the United States. Laboratory assessment, in general, laboratory values that may be decreased in the presence of undernourishment include cholesterol, hemoglobin, hematocrit, serum albumin, tyroxine, vitamin, prealbumin, and transferrin. 
So um, improving nutrition, what are we going to do? We're going to meet the patient's metabolic needs. That's the most important. Meal management, um, following the primary health care provider and register diet, dietitian nutritionist recommendation, provide high caloric, yes, in the case of under uh, nutrition, nutrient-rich food, milkshake, cheese, and supplement drinks, such a boost or ensure. Here is the controversy. Um, here is the controversy. So let me show you something. Um, I don't know if I'm doing right or wrong in this part, but I think it's my responsibility to show you. So here is Ensure, which is a nutritional uh, shake. And I am going to um, go all the way to the ingredients of Ensure. Um, we are going to see. Uh, we have water, corn, maltodextrin, which is dextrosa, which is glucose. On top of that, sugar, meal protein. Um, but the one that I am really worried the most is here. I don't know if you can see it here in the line number one, two, three, four, and five, carrageninina. Carrageninina is linked to cancer. Okay, carrageninina is linked to cancer. Please check all your um, cans of milks and products. Always read the label, okay? Um, because this ingredient is everywhere. Okay? Carahenina. That's something you need to avoid. Um, okay, let me continue. So that's in Ensure. And that is prescribed to many patients. Boost as well. Nutritional supplementations. If the patient cannot take in enough nutrients in food, fortified medical nutrition supplements, Example, Ensure, Catal, Carnation, Carnation, all products from Carnation has carrageninina. Also available as a lactose-free supplement, may be given especially to older adults. For patients with liver and renal disease or diabetes, so you're going to give dextrose, Ensure, to a diabetic. The special products that meet these needs are available. Glucerna has also carrageninina for patients with diabetes and is high in glucose as well. So here's an article about um, carrageninina. Um, dangers and side effects of carrageninin, inflammation, bloating, irritable bowel syndrome, glucose intolerance, colon cancer, and food um, Allergies. Products with carrageninin may be labeled as natural, but limited studies show that carrageninin may promote or cause, but limited studies. So there are studies which are limited, um, but maybe uh, there is not enough budget to do extra studies. So I'm just letting you know what I understand, what I found. What, I mean, we all talk about it, right? Promoting nutri nutrition intake, um, the environmental, you are going to remove bedpans, urinal, and MSs basins from the environment. Remember, these patients need to have, I think I need to close the window. <laughs> Eliminate or decrease offensive odors as much as possible so they don't have, um, but uh, orders and they feel motivated um, to eat, right? Uh, comfort, allow the patients to toilet before meal time, provide mouth care before meal time. Function, um, ensure that meals are visually appealing, appetizing, and at appropriate temperatures. And so I have another um, link about glucerna uh, that I'm not gonna show because I think it's enough, right? enough evidence. Okay, drug therapy, multivitamin zinc, and an iron preparation are often ordered to treat or prevent anemia patients who are malnourished. 
monitor the patient hemoglobin and hematocrit levels for efficacy of treatment and assess for side effects. For example, iron can cause constipation, we know that, and zinc can cause nausea and vomiting. Now, total parental nutrition, those who can eat but cannot maintain adequate nutrition by oral intake of food alone are um, good candidates for total uh, enteral, sorry, total enteral nutrition. And we know that enteral is uh, the nutrition that is going to be given through any port, any access through the gastrointestinal, especially the small intestine more frequently, those with permanent neuromuscular impairment who cannot swallow, and those who don't have permanent neuromuscular impairment but cannot eat because of their condition, um, right, like cancer patients, for example. Patients in the first group are often older adults or patients receiving cancer treatment, so they are talking about those who can eat but cannot maintain adequate nutrition by oral intake or food alone, which are the cancer patients, right? Um, sometimes these patients are vomiting all the time because of the effects of the chemotherapy. So that's why they need this internal nutrition. Uh, check for advanced techniques stating whether the patient desires artificial nutrition and hydration if certain conditions exist. If advanced directives are not in place, yet the patient has a designated durable power of attorney, that individual can make health-related decisions when the patient is available to do so. So you have the durable power of attorney is the patient is designating somebody to take decisions for them. Okay, that's the durable power of a of, of attorney. Um, ethics committees and feedings decisions about legal ethical situations regarding feeding benefit from the involvement of interprofessional committees in healthcare facilities. Uh, when clinicians are making decisions about the desirability of tube feedings for patients who cannot express their own wishes and who do not have an advanced directive in place. So advanced directive in place is a decision of the patient itself of what to do in case they, they cannot decide, right? That's the difference with the durable power of attorney in which somebody else is assigned by the patient to take the decision. So that's important. I told you this chapter is the most important of the semester. It's not only the, the condition, the nutritional condition of the patient who's gonna help them prevent uh, comorbidities if the GI tract is in good health and is um, getting enough nutrients, right? Um, but also this is important because we are talking about the, the care in the hospital in case of the patient being in the last stages of life or with conditions that are very um, very critical right so this is one this is for me the most important chapter in this semester patients in the third group um okay those in the second group so we are talking about here the patients that are those with permanent neuromuscular impairment who cannot swallow okay um are likely to receive um, total enteral nutrition usually have permanent swallowing problems due to conditions such as brain attacks severe head trauma or advanced multiple sclerosis and this last one i've seen in a lot uh, multiple sclerosis now we have the third group is those who do not have permanent do not have permanent neurovascular impairment but cannot eat because of their condition so they are having a temporary situations the patients in the third group receive enteral nutrition for as long as their illness lasts okay it's a temporary um, situation. NCLEX question. A client with terminal cancer who is comatose, terminal cancer and is comatose has a durable power of attorney but no advanced directive, meaning the patient did not put in writing her or his wishes. But however, somebody else has been assigned to take the decision, the durable power of attorney. When total enteral nutrition is prescribed, which nursing action would be appropriate, right? 
So we have A, contact the durable power of attorney, B, begin administration of the total enteral, C, consult the interprofessional ethic committee, or ask the healthcare provider where to start nutritional therapy. So in this case, number one, if there is no advanced directive, you go to number two, which is the durable power of attorney, and that's the answer. Okay, I have also provided you with um, another website because we need to have all the resources in order to understand all these concepts and, and legal issues. It's from the American Cancer Society, types of advanced directive. You will find all these concepts and explanation in your supplemental material, right? So I am teaching this lecture and you are getting everything in one video. Um, after this, you are ready to take the NCLEX. So here you have the rationale for the um, for that NCLEX question, right? Um, now, methods of administering total enteral uh, nutrition. Um, you have a nasoenteric tube. Um, please uh, break down the word so you can understand the method of administration of the total enteral nutrition. You have a nasoduodenal tube, enterostomal feeding tubes, gastrostomy, endoscopy gastrostomy pack, jejunostomy, continuous feeding. So it's going to this this paragraph here. Um, they are telling you the types of um, administration for the enteral uh, nutrition and also what procedures they use in order to administer and to place those tubes. Okay, and you need to be familiarized with those. I'm sure you got this information in the first semester or second semester when you are learning about the procedures, right? And your skills. So this is just a refresh, a refresh. Okay, nursing safety priority. If a gastrostomy or jejunostomy tube cannot be moved while you are performing your regular assessment. Notify the healthcare practitioner immediately because the retention disc may be embedded in the tissue. Cover the site with a dry, sterile dressing and change the dressing at least once a day. And that's good to know. NCLEX alert. Everything related to nursing interventions, nursing education. Okay. Um, pre and post operative care should be your main focus of study. Complication of total enteral nutri nutrition. The most common problem is the development of an obstructed clock tube. Okay, and other complications including refeeding syndrome, tube misplacement and dislodgement, abdominal distension and nausea, vomiting and problems with fluid and electrolyte uh, balance often associated with diarrhea. The, these patients are at risk for these other complications, okay? So you need to master in case of these um, uh, tubes that are um, obstructed or clogged, you need to review how is the procedure, what is the procedure mm -hmm. for each complication, how you solve each complication, okay? Uh, in the practice, there are many techniques that maybe they are not in the book, okay? And uh, I am not going to discuss what I've seen in the hospital. Um, I want you to refer to your textbook and double check what is the appropriate way to, um, to uh, repair, let's say this way, an obstructed clock tube, right? And what you need to do in those cases, okay? Um, 
here in the course we are talking about nutrition, we are not talking about the procedures and skills. So tube misplacement and dislodgement um, of the tube can cause aspiration and possible death. Immediately remove any tube that you suspect is dislodged. An x-ray is the most accurate confirmation method and should always be done on initial tube insertion. So here they are giving you some hints about what to do in case of dislodgement. Uh, action alert. If enteral tubes are misplaced or become dislodged, the the patient is likely to aspirate. Aspiration pneumonia is a life-threatening complication associated with total enteral nutrition. Aspiration pneumonia is a life-threatening complication associated with total enteral nutrition. And that's good to know. NCLEX alert, especially for older adults, observe for fever and signs of dehydration especially I would say on patients that are having, if they are having UTI and they are confused, you know, that UTI causes confusion. So these patients are not going to let you know they are not, they, at all, they are not giving you any hint that they are, they are suffering, uh, they are having a complications. Um, if you see a patient uh, with fever and signs of dehydration, such as dry mucous membranes and decreased urinary output, you need to auscultate the lungs every four to eight hours to check for diminishing breath sounds, especially in lower lows. And as I always tell you, this is good in the book. In theory, four to eight hours for me is too much. I will be checking and assessing those lung sounds every two hours just to protect the patient's safety. Safety. Okay, patient safety first, and then um, you have to do your job and protect your license. Anything can happen from one hour to another. For theory, you have to follow your hospital protocols. Um, in theory, just let's follow for your NCLEX examination for two to eight hours. This is the theory. Um, in the practice, when you are taking care for an elder patient, please do it as often as possible. Patient may become short of breath and report chest discomfort. This is a life-threatening condition. If a chest x-ray confirms the diagnosis, treatment with antibiotics will be started. Okay. In terms of your NCLEX and because this is a theory that is presented in the book and we are following the book, well, follow these practices in 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 real life check these patients very often abdominal distension and nausea and vomiting abdominal distension nausea and vomiting during tube feeding are often caused by overfeeding to prevent overfeeding to prevent the overfeeding first be a compassionate nurse don't rush in your care Okay, do your job with love. Check gastric residual volumes every six hours, depending on agency policy and patient assessment. I would say depending on patient assessment first and then your agency policy, because if you assess your patient and that patient doesn't look good, the six hours is not a good protocol. Probably you have to follow every three, every two. Okay, but we are following the book. Fluid and electrolytes imbalances. A patient with renal problems and existing high potassium levels may be given a special formula lower in potassium. Fluid imbalances associated with internal nutrition are usually related to the body's response to increased serum osmolarity, but fluid overload uh, from too much to feeding can also occur. If patients do not have normal renal or cardiac uh, function, expansion of the plasma volume can lead to circulatory overload and pulmonary edema, especially in older adults. Assess for signs and symptoms such as peripheral edema, sudden weight gain, crackles, dyspnea, increased blood pressure and bounding pulse. Report this to the healthcare provider. My Honestly advice, my honest advice to you guys, there are going to be new grad nurses, is that the first year of nursing is the hardest one. 
you need to master your assessments in the first year. Right now that you're at school, try to assist to every open lab you can, any skill uh, lab um, that you can practice or your skills, all your skills because you have the lives of the patients in your hands under your care. So at least if you don't know the side effect of the medication, which is also extremely important, you can you are going to see many providers ordering medications. And if you don't know the side effect and if, if you cannot match the symptoms of the patient with the side effect of the medication that is being prescribed, remember you are the last step between prescription and administration uh, of the medication to the patient, then if you are not convinced and sure about your knowledge, the patient is the one suffering. So two things, master all your skills, how you assess your lung sounds, your heart sounds, how do you feed the patient that is having uh, feeding tubes, this and that, okay? And review your pharmacology, okay? First year, the most difficult. But then it's gonna be easy once you are an expert. Best practice for patient safety and quality care, feeding tube care and maintenance. Um, I just highlighted for me the ones that are more significant. Um, the initial placement of the tube should be confirmed by an X-ray study. Uh, also check and document residual volume every six hours or per agency policy by aspirating stomach contents into a syringe. The fact that I'm not reading the whole paragraph does not mean that it's not important, okay? I'm just trying to summarize. Then you can go over your book and everything in detail. To prevent aspiration, keep the head of the bed elevated at least 30 degrees during the feeding and for at least one hour after the feeding for bolus feeding. This is common sense, right? You are not going to put the patient in a supine position after completing the feeding. Monitor laboratory values, especially blood, urea, nitrogen, serum, electrolytes, and hematocrit, prealbumin, and glucose. So we continue with the best practice for patient safety and quality care, maintaining a patent feeding tube. And here you have all the steps, all the steps that you need to check to maintain patency of the feeding tube, right? Um, okay, let me... Let me go. Excessive diarrhea and or dehydration may develop when hyperosmolar enteral preparations are delivered quickly and excessive water loss is experienced. So hyperosmolar means that there are high concentrations of certain ingredients. It's certain. It's not keratin. <laughs> of certain ingredients, okay? That is hyperosmolar. One more iso or smaller formula may be needed in case of the of the patient having a hyper or smaller uh, enteral preparation. If diarrhea continues and, es and especially if it has a very foul odor, if the very foul odor uh, happens, evaluate for Clostridium difficile, C difficile, or other infec infectious um, organism. C diff. So you enter the unit that has 30 rooms in it. And as soon as you enter, you can smell C. diff in the entire unit. That's the way it smells. Uh, the two most common electrolyte imbalances associated with internal nutrition therapy are hyperkalemia and hyponatremia. Both of these conditions may be related to hyperglycemia induced hyperosmolarity of the plasma and the resultant osmotic diuresis. Remember when there is high glucose, the glucose is going to be, to be eliminated and uh, through urination or through water, water is going to be uh, loose and um, sodium also goes with water and um, because of this glucose, okay? That's why it's hypernatremia, always the inverse relationship between potassium and sodium. Refeeding syndrome is a potentially life-threatening complication. 
related to fluid and electrolyte shift during aggressive nutritional rehabilitation of the patient in a state of starvation. Now, nursing safety priority, and that's good to know. Recognize signs of refeeding syndrome, which includes hypophosphatemia and hypokalemia noted in laboratory values, heart failure, peripheral edema, rhabdomyolysis, seizures, hemolysis, and respiratory insufficiency. Report, respond by contacting the healthcare provided immediately. More information on fluid and electrolytes balance can be found in chapter 13. So probably you did this chapter already in a previous semester. So we have here parental nutrition, okay, which is the nutrition um, when a patient cannot effectively use the GI tract for nutrition, either partial or total parental nutrition therapy may be needed. This form of nutrition is introduced into the veins and differs from a standard IV therapy in that any of the nutrients, carbohydrates, protein, fats, vitamins, minerals, electrolytes, and trace elements can be given now we have peripheral parental and nutrition, which is administered through a cannula or catheter in a large distal vein of the arm on a short term basis. It is usually used for patients who, cannot, who can eat, but are not able to take in enough nutrients to meet their needs. So PPN is fat-based and does not contain all the carbs that patient needs, so it is not used on a long-term basis, and this is good to know. PPN is fat-based, and um, parental nutrition has all nutrients, carbs, protein, fats, vitamin, minerals, and electrolytes, okay? That's the difference. Critical rescue is recognize that you must monitor patients receiving fat emulsions for fever, increased triglycerides, clotting problems, and multi-system organ failure, which may indicate fat overload syndrome. So when a patient is receiving a PPN, you need to monitor for all these symptoms and you need to check your laboratory for this, especially in patients who are critically ill. Respond to any of these signs and symptoms by discontinuing the IV fat emulsion infusion and reporting the changes to the healthcare provider immediately. So that's good to know. NCLEX alert. Total parental nutrition when the patient requires intensive nutrition support for an extended time, the healthcare provider orders centrally administered total parental nutrition. Um, is uh, administered through a temporary central line inserted in the neck or chest, a long-term tunnel, catheter, or implanted part inserted by the chest, or via a peak line. Okay, this type of nutrition is hypertonic and contains a high glucose content. Thank you for mentioning that. Total parental nutrition, PPN based on fat uh, nutrients, parental nutrition has carbohydrate, proteins, fat, vitamins, and minerals, and the total parental is given via um, temporary central line or peak line. Okay, so here you have the image. This is the TPN. You have your pump and you have the catheter, right? Total parental nutrition. And these solutions are administered via an infusion pump. The osmolarity of the fluid and the concentration of the specific components may control the liver essential. So the patient in cardiac or renal dysfunction can develop problems with fluid and electrolyte balance, including fluid overload, heart failure, pulmonary edema. So those are the things that you always need to check, uh, respiratory function and cardiac function, okay? Also, you're going to, um, uh, the, you need to check the, the blood work because the doctor is going to uh, order uh, serum electrolyte levels uh, very often to see how is the status. Potassium, sodium uh, imbalances are very common, especially when insulin is also administered as part of the therapy. Remember that the TPN has a high content of glucose, right? Calcium imbalances, particularly hypercalcemia, are associated with TPN. 
the risk for metabolic and electrolytes complication is reduced when the administration rate is carefully controlled and patients are closely observed, meaning the nurse is there next to the patient, checking every single minute what's going on. Good nurse. Monitor for any of these imbalances or report any major changes or... So in these cases, you need experienced nurses, right? That are going, checking um, not only the appearance of the patient, who it, which can tell you the patient, wow, the patient maybe is having fever, maybe uh, I need to check the blood pressure, you know, changes in the skin or whatever. And then you go the laboratory results. You need to monitor this. You, you're going to monitor the 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 pump okay um this is nclex maximum alert okay best practice for patient safety and quality care for total parental nutrition if the tpn administration is not on time or is behind do not attempt to catch up by increasing the rate of the pump that's why i highlight it because it usually happens and i've seen it okay and then when that happened you need to do two things first you need to hold that nurse on the side and tell you know i've seen this and i really ask you to correct this operation and tell the nursing supervisor about what's happening if you don't do that i am going to report this to the nurse supervisor okay and monitor and document the patient's weight daily or according to facility protocol because then you become a witness of something that is putting in danger the life of a patient right you need to report this um monitor serum electrolytes and glucose daily or per facility protocol and basically these the ones are here highlighted um, are the most important home care management um, double check if resources are available for nutritional supplement, self-management education. The registered dietitian nutritionist teaches the patient with undernutrition and family as indicated about a high calorie, high protein diet and nutrition supplements. It is important for you as the nurse to reinforce the importance of adhering to the order diet, review any drugs, the importance of taking iron, and all these important factors, like for example, uh, ways to prevent constipation, um, adequate uh, fiber intake, adequate fluids and exercise. Guys, this chapter is long, but as I am telling you, this is the most important chapter in this semester. And in general, it's the most important chapter of your career, okay? It's basically nutrition, not only for the patient, but if you get all that information, it's going to be for you at the end of the road. We all, we are all heading to that moment in which we're going to be admitted on a hospital and we need a good nurse to take care of us. And we need somebody who monitors how the feeding is being administered. We are all heading there sooner or later. Okay. We need good nutrition in order to have the GI um, imbalance and we prevent all these comorbidities. Please, if you have the time and the interest, review this chapter two, three, four times, no matter how many hours you're going to spend. No matter if you are listening while you are driving, if you are listening in your, in your Bluetooth, while you are walking, cooking, doing the bed, whatever time you have. This is extremely important chapter, okay? When we come back, we're gonna close this chapter with this horror in healthcare, obesity. We spoke about this, right? We have 8.1 billion people in the world and one third of that population, meaning 2,400 million people in the world are suffering from overweight and obesity. We need to take care of this, take care of our children and our families. Obesity is a chronic state. And the last um, thing that obesity causes is cancer, all type of cancer. Obesity is involved in all types of cancer. So when we come back, we're gonna talk about that. And please enjoy, don't get bored with this information. It's, 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 
important for our well-being. Thank you.